Hello, welcome to McKinley. Today I'm going to show you how and why we integrate the database with Train Controller. It's a bit nerdy, I hope you enjoy it. So, to explain why we've integrated the database with Train Controller, I'm going to give you a quick summary of the whole of the environment for McKinley Railway so that you understand the pieces. The first part is Train Controller. This is on the screen sitting behind me. We've been using it for nearly 20 years and it's a very reliable piece of software that drives trains around the layout, resolves conflicts and does good things. Um, the, there's a lot of work involved in getting it all set up, especially with all the block detection. But once you've got that figured out and the two are working together, that's the railway and train controller, it works fine. Train controller links to the railway through Loconet. And Loconet is a big key component because we stitched in the database with Loconet. The railway itself, which is based on Digitrax, is a collection of seven large station stroke yards around the top floor of my house. Each of those station stroke yards is operated by human operators between two and three people together and their job is to prepare trains for departure, getting coaching stock out of carriage sidings, getting the locomotive out of the engine shed, etc, etc, getting the ready into the platforms against a schedule. The database has the schedule, the timetable and they're, they're running to the clock. It's not overly stressed, but they're running to the clock. They have to get the Blue Pullman out of the carriage sidings for the 11 a.m. to Manchester. These stations, they're all interlinked, and we rely on train controller to do all the driving of trains between the stations. So operators manage the stations and all the movements and shuntings within them, and train controller drives the trains around the main layout. The reason we need to rely on train controller to, to drive the trains is twofold. The first is it would require another 10 operators and we don't have space for that. And the second is the, the design of the track work is not suitable for operators walking alongside their trains. We have trains that disappear into tunnels, flip to the other side, behind um, a screen wall and come out on the other side. So the operator would have to be like Flash Gordon, rushing around the railway just to see where his train was. And a large proportion of it is also hidden underground. So train controller and operators run the railway. The database that we use, I've talked about it before. One of the things we did in the previous videos with the database was talking about how we're watching the Loconet traffic, so all the sensors, all the switches, all the signals, all that data is coming in and the database effectively has a real-time map of the railway. In addition, we've linked it in with the RFID tags and antennas with the stock so that we know where the stock is in real time on the whole of the layout and this is down to individual sidings or staging areas on the main lines. Wherever we put an RFID sensor, it will track where those trains go. We run the railway to a timetable, as I just mentioned, and that's the core component that station managers use in order to prepare their trains. And that same timetable is also used by the person that sits at this desk here, who is the operations manager. His job is quite tricky. He's got the database list of schedules over here, and he's got train controller here. And when we first started this database integration, we did not have any linkage between the two. And it was quite an involved job for him to select and manage to get the trains into the right platform in Train Controller, and then to set off the right schedule to take that train and make sure that it went to the right destination. And it was an easy mistake to make to select the wrong platform, to release it, or to put the wrong stock into the right platform. So one classic example was we had a Freightliner train arrive in platform five because we'd selected the wrong track in staging. <laughs> that was me. I had to make tea for a month for that mistake. I was not forgiven, and quite rightly so. And that prompted me to think, how could we make this better? 
So now we get to the crux of this. We've got the train in the schedule and Ian, as station manager in Sheffield, has got a train ready and using his station manager tablet and the RFID system that's moved the stock into the platform. So the database knows what's there. Ian has requested that it goes to departure. So what I've got to do is go back to the database and if I click on the database here, it shows me as the operations manager I have the engine and you can see that it's reverse orientation and I've got two triplets and a brake fan, brake fan 63. In train controller what we've then got to do is check that that stock has been migrated in there. Now I'm making a leap of faith here. There are three pieces of technology that we rely on to make this happen. Transponding, sensors and switches. We will be using transponding from the database, so we're not using transponding in the DCC sense, we're using transponding as defined in the Locanet spec. And we'll be transmitting over Locanet to train controller, the engine transponding ID and the freight, uh, freight brake vans transponding ID. It doesn't even have a chip in it, but the point is it, it allows us with RFID to transpond anything we wish. And what we intend to do is once I have confirmed on screen here that that set is that I've got it correct, it will have already been populated here, and this I use as a check to see that everything has come across and the engine is being positioned in the right order. Something to note on the icons here is that we've done quite a lot of work, and what I thought I'd share with you is a list of some of the icons and the methodology or the, the principles behind it, because it's really important to be consistent. As you can imagine, we're always a bit obsessed by that. I've got some icons here to share. The first one is a steam locomotive. It's a five-digit locomotive address. And of course, DCC is only th four. Therefore, we make a convention of masking the middle one. So this engine's address in DCC is 4808. This engine here is 6183 digitally, and if you notice there's a red underline on the steam engine, we don't have to identify the orientation because we've got a funnel. Steam engines are easy in train controller in DCC land. Another engine, this is a right-facing steam engine icon, 6183 is its ID. When we come to diesel locomotives, that's a real challenge because they don't have uh, uh, you can't tell where the number one end is. And so we put a big square or a triangle there. The squares indicate that there is sound in the locomotive and the triangles indicate that there is just which it is non-sound and therefore that's where the number one end is. Here we use with coaching stock or with power DMUs we have a special icon which is the, the coach ID or the DMU ID and a number emboldened onto it to show the number of carriages. So this is a six car Midland Pullman set. Here is an electro diesel, green one, uh, with a triangle which means it's a non-sound locomotive. Here is a blue sound class 31, address 3168 and so on and so on. Then we get down to the freight vans. We put the icons up, we've added the number, and this is the same visual tag we use for our freight management system. So this is FB41. There's another one, FB65. And we've also got in here, just to show you, the things we've done uh, for the grain wagons and for the soda ash wagons and so on and so on and so on. There's lots and lots of them down here. Um, each of them I'm going to go through. We can just gently slide through them one at a time. There's a brake tender. <laughs> That's going to be interesting. Here's a clever adaptation we did. This is a mixed rate of maroon and blue-gray coaches, and it's an eight-car set. Here we have a blood and custard four-car set. Here we have a blood and custard and maroon six-car set. Here is what we're going to be using for one of our scenic trains. I'll describe those in a minute. It's a Freightliner scenic train, and we'll put the number of wagons, or, yeah, the number of wagons will go on there in a similar vein. So that gives you some idea of the classification process we use for our icons in both train controller and in the database. In the database we have the luxury of being able to flip the icon facing left and right so the number is always legible. 
In train controller, there's just one icon, and when the train's facing the other way, you have to be a bit of a reverse graphics reader to work out what the engine number is when you see it in a block. But it's an important component. So I'm now happy, as the operations manager, that the transponding process, remember we haven't got transponding fitted, but this is what I want it to be like, has delivered these two objects into that block. And I'm happy with that. So now what I do is I confirm the waiting for path. And then what I'm going to do now is I will then fire it off that train and so it should be ready to de depart. Dispatch train and perform that and you will see it, you will hear something go on here now, listen to this. The noise indicates the train controller has received the instruction and the engine is now leaving and if I put the mouse here you will see that that locomotive has got a reserve path. It's occupying the track as it leaves the exit route out of Sheffield. And this is a test process we're using here. This is not utilizing the full layout. It's just level D on the railway. It's coming out of the exit route here and it's leaving Sheffield, going into the sidings and it will go into one of these tracks here. And the path it's chosen is the empty block here, which is green green 87 and you can see the progress being made in addition the database software has also locked the block to stop this arriving class 40 train coming into Sheffield the points are set the points are being cleared the train is moving in and train controller I can't show it with you the schedule window but it's moving it through it's got it into the block and in a moment when you see this little er dot click on over here where my mouse is, when that goes red, that train will finish and the schedule will be complete. So we talked about transponding being used to populate the block with the locomotive and the freight set. The database has, for every schedule that exists in train controller, there is identical record in the database. And associated with that is a sensor address and what happens is when the database gets when, when I as operations manager click start that schedule it sends off a sensor message to train controller train controller can respond to inbound sensor messages only sensor messages and transponding the sensor message is an object in train controller which we link to starting off a specific schedule when train controller starts that schedule, we've embedded in the schedule a specific thing, and I think it's to throw a switch. So switch 999 gets thrown. That's sent back out over Loconet, read by the database software that goes, oh, that schedule I've just kicked off and told train controller to do. Yep, I've just had a response back that indicates it started. And then it's going to wait for that same switch number, 999, to, be, to go the other way. If I said closed a minute ago, it'll be thrown. If it was thrown, it'll be closed. I can't quite remember today being in front of the camera. You know what it's like. So it will do all that, and the database is then kept in sync with the with train controller. So the two work hand in glove. And the beautiful bit is, when we finish this transponding element, the operations manager, manager's job is going to be a whole lot easier. So there was one movement of a train. The software sent a sensor message out to train controller. Train controller sent a switch message out. It also sent out an audible sound. We managed to find some sounds off a Nokia phone and shorten them. And we've used an upbeat sound to say it's a train um, a schedule that's been triggered by the operations manager manually. And we also have a different sound, a slightly downbeat sound, for trains that are triggered automatically without the operations manager having to do anything. And you might be thinking, whoa, why would he do that? Here's why. Let me take you back to my childhood and the scenic trains that used to go through the stations, the freight trains. We don't have a colliery here. We don't have a power station. But I saw dozens and dozens of freight trains, coal trains, going through stations. And that's part of the attraction that we can do here on McKinley. 
I've got a, the diagram of Hades here. There are 180 storage tracks in this yard and around the layout there's another 30 staging tracks. Scenic trains as well as time machine trains are going to be stored there. All of these blocks here can be used for trains in a specific period and we will rely on the database to pull a train up automatically, run it round the layout and then send it back to its, its home yard. So all the trains that live in the time machine, the database knows which yard they should go back to at the end of their session or their playtime or their airtime, whatever you want to call it. So we have automated trains that are both the time machine stuff coming up for use depending on the era clock. We have the scenic trains running around within era. So for example, the HAA trains will be pulled around um, by a class 47 and they will start coming around approximately 1965 or thereabouts. The same with freight liners. Um, they're scenic trains. We don't have a freight liner terminal, but we have a lot of trains to run around. Um, and then the other last thing is, you can see in the block in these things, there's lots of sequential blocks. There's chains of tracks. And what happens is there's four or five trains all backed up in a specific uh, line. And the front train is pulled off by the database. We rely on the database to shuffle all these trains up automatically. It will just do them periodically. It will always be scanning for empty blocks and seeing if there's an empty block and there's a full block behind it. And if that block is a pull-up block, it will move that train forward and it will instruct train controller, please run the schedule from, from block 950 to block 990 or whatever they have. They've got a specific designation and I won't bore, that, I won't bore you with that today but it works. It's in the proving stage, but I'm very confident we're going to get there. So I hope you've enjoyed this. It's a bit techy. Um, if you've got any questions, please ask and I'll try and respond. And thanks for watching.